Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York. This is 821 6th Avenue near 29th Street. Its humdrum exterior belies the exceptional history that happened here. 821 6th in the 1950s was a jazz loft, a sanctum where musicians could jam, making music for their own pleasure, no audience invited. Thelonious Monk played here, so did Zoot Sims and Chick Corea and hundreds of lesser known sidemen. We know this because esteemed photojournalist W. Eugene Smith recorded everything that happened here for eight years on film and audio tape. Smith's prodigious output is the subject of a documentary, The Jazz Loft, written and directed by Sarah Fishko of WNYC. Her fascinating film salutes the artistry of a troubled genius and recalls a time when New York streets throbbed with the rhythms of jazz. Sarah Fishko and the Jazz Loft, next. Sarah Fishko, what a delight to have you here. Thank you. And what a delightful film. Let's start with Gene Smith, photojournalist. Tell us about him as a photojournalist. Gene Smith was uh, at the absolute top of the world of photojournalism. He was working for Life magazine, which is what every still photographer wanted to be doing. Uh, and he was also building on the idea of still photography by creating these photo essays. So he was one of the Life magazine great ones. There's a, there's a photo in your film of him with Robert Kappa and, and uh, Edward Steichen. Yeah. Yes, so, he was I mean, he, right was on, he was on that level. He was right up there. He was much admired, and uh, the photography world certainly thought of him as a major, major player who had accomplished so much and who had uh, really, in a way, participated and invented the photo essay, but he took it to a, to a level that was, mm. that was new. How come we don't know his name, like we know Steichen and Kappa and some of the others? Well, it, it's a good question. I, I think that he was a little harder to get a handle on. He did so many things, including spending eight years at a loft photographing out the window and photographing jazz musicians. I think other photographers might have had a more perceptible identity. Uh, but, of course, he did become very famous toward the end of his life with Minamata, mm. a, um, his, his extraordinary book and photo essay uh, about... Uh, well, he seems to have walked away. I mean, he, he has his remarkable career at, at life, but he seems to have walked away from it and, and perhaps, as your film suggests, wasn't entirely suited to it because he wanted to control everything. I mean, he, he didn't like the fact that, hey, I take pictures and I give them to you, the layout guy and the editor, and they decide where it goes and how many of them and all the... He wanted control. That's exactly right. And, and I think uh, as successful as he was at life, um, it... it fell apart because over those issues, over issues of control. He, the thing about Smith was that he was always divided between art and journalism. Mm. He was always, that was always pulling him apart. Am I an artist or do I have an obligation as a journalist or can I be both? And uh, I think Life magazine came down on the side of journalism and Gene Smith came down on the side of art and he uh, was constantly trying to reinvent himself and figure out a way he could have total control. And can we as ascribe that as one of the reasons or the main reason why he leaves a wife, four kids, house in Westchester, and moves to this dump on... We can. We can certainly say that was one of the reasons. The other reasons are less known to us, but that's the most visible reason. And you're also talking about somebody who was assigned, for example, to shoot a hundred pictures of the city of Pittsburgh, and at the end of uh, uh, you know a year or two, had twenty two thousand photographs to present mm. to his commissioner of those uh, huh. of those hundred pictures. so we're talking about somebody obsessed 
of a, yes, obsession is the word, excess. He was just too much, everything about him. So he moves to this loft, which, had, which already was a, a hangout for jazz music. Yes, it had already become a jazz loft. And, and he seemed to love music. Uh, he always had music accompanying what he did in his photography. Yes. This place was a, a rat trap, a dilapidated hole. I mean, <laughs> it was... Yes. I can't imagine living there, and he lived there with some of these other people. Yes. It, it had been pioneered by an artist called David X. Young, and Young was the first person in there who tried to make it livable. And he was a young artist in New York, and a lot of his friends were jazz players. And they started, uh, you know, it was this big place, and it cost nothing. Mm. You know, it was very, very cheap. Let's and, look at a, at a section of uh, Sarah's remarkable film about Gene Smith at the loft, just photographing jazz musicians and recording them. When I walked in the room, three walls, floor to ceiling, filled with photographs. But that was just the beginning. That was what was the underlying layer. Then into those photographs were stuck many other photographs, so that they were kind of leaning out, so that you felt all these walls were just leaning in on you with photographs. He was like a mad scientist. <laughs> He'd have this big old desk, and there would be pictures and negatives and tapes. Prints, layouts, dummies. I mean, the loft was packed with stuff. At the same time, he's doing the jazz things. He's shooting out the window. He's, I mean, this man worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. Hmm, just extraordinary. Um, worked and worked and worked. How much work? How much did we find? Uh, discovered uh, in the Smith Archive uh, were 4,000 hours of audio tape 4, that he recorded. 4,000 hours. As well as um, uh, 45,000 exposed negatives in, in the loft over the years. So, oh. You know, it's a lot of, it's, it's, as I say, the excess is just the, the obsession. It's, it's, and who found it, and, and has it been cataloged, has it been? Uh, the material was essentially, the audio material was discovered by Sam Stevenson, who became He's interested. in the film. In, yeah, and he became interested in Smith, um, and he uh, went to the Smith Archive in Tucson, Tucson, Arizona. And in the corner, there were some boxes sitting there. And he said, well, you know, and he was looking around at all the photographs. And then he saw these boxes and said, what, what's that? And they said, well, that's some tapes. You know, he said, well, I'd like to see those. Uh, Stevenson is a completist. He likes to know everything well, about the subject. You would think he's the archives would, might have wanted to know what was on those He's a researcher and tapes. a writer. And in his heart, he's a completist. So he said, what, are, what is on those tapes? They open the boxes, and the on the spines of these quarter-inch tape boxes are the f famous first names of jazz. There's the name Thelonious, and Sam. And Zoot. And Zoot. And Roland, you know, Roland Kirk was there. And, uh, you know. Uh, later Rasson Roland Kirk. Later Rasson Roland Kirk, exactly. And Sam uh, happened by some good fortune to be a jazz fan. So, of course, he recognized all these mm. names, and he suddenly realized what he had stumbled on were the lost tapes. Well, we should, we should tell the audience that, that uh, uh, Gene Smith, another example, I guess, of his obsessiveness, he wired the whole building. I mean, all five floors, he put microphones everywhere. He even had it engineered so that he had a switching system. So if there was something interesting going on on the third floor and it got boring on the first floor, he could go to some control panel and switch over to, to some rockin' session on, <laughs> on three. So, you know. And how do you come to this? What happened is when Sam discovered this material, he realized that it was going to be his life's work for the next decade or whatever it was. He just, it was, it was obviously a precious 
collection and there was so much of it. So he started giving talks around New York, you know, just like showing people samples of the photographs, samples of the mm. tapes in an effort to get people interested, raise some funding so that he could travel around and figure out what was on them. Nobody even knew what were, what, who was there, what was on these tapes. And somebody went to one of these things and called me the next day and said, you know, there's this guy walking around who's got like, a <laughs> tape of Thelonious Monk walking around, you know, in circles in, in, a, in some loft. I think there's something there. Uh, and I called him the next mm. day and, you know, it took me about one minute to say, I'm yes, in. There's something there. Yeah. Yes, I'm in. Yeah. Mm, what a great phone call to get. Yeah. Well, and, and, and to your credit, to see that this was rich material and there was a lot to do with it. It was astounding. The material is just, it continues to be. There's so much that's astounding, including the fact that these boxes and the tapes which bring to life the photos that this archive is showing, the boxes sat there for 20 years and nobody lo lis listened to them at that, at that well, it was a, archive. Well, it was a photo archive, you know? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Whatever else. <laughs> Duh, you know, okay. It was yeah. a photo archive, so they thought, well, this is not really our you know, and as I say, it took a completist to walk in there and say, I want to see every single shred of anything that came out of that archive, that came out of that building. Yeah. So you're in and, what, 10 years, and not, not exclusively, I mean, you, you have a lot yes, of work I've to do for WNYC and public radio, but 10 years you worked on this. Well, I brought the project into WNYC, basically, because the first thing I wanted to do, the first thing was the audio. I wasn't even thinking about the photographs. But mm. I, I said, let's make a public radio series out of it. This is a natural series. And meanwhile, Sam wrote this wonderful book called The Jazz Loft Project, which is writings and interviews and impressions upon listening to the tapes. It's kind of like a documentary in book form and a meditation in book form on this loft and also has many of the pictures in mm -hmm. the book, reproduced in the book, which I, I, I believe the book is now out of print but can still be found. Well, we should point out, and since you're saying you brought the, um, uh, the project to WNYC, you did, what, 10-part series on this, um, and any viewer can just go to the NYC, WNYC uh, uh, website yes. and find those. Jazz those, Loft radio series. The Jazz Search Loft, it, yeah. It comes right up. Fabulous stuff, including one whole hour of just basically just the music. Right, uh, the jam sessions. The jam sessions. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think, I mean, we've talked a little bit about Gene Smith's obsessive two lives, what was he doing? What, what did, what did, do we have any idea what he thought we, he was doing? We don't know. That was one of the big attractions of it, is that there was a mystery about it. You know, not that we ever hoped to solve it, but it, it was mysterious. Here was a guy, uh, uh, you know, one of the most brilliant photographers in America, some, some thought the most brilliant, um, and he's taping everything. And, and then he says, well, and shooting 45,000 pictures. And shooting uh, an extraordinary number of pictures. And we're, you know, and, he's, uh, and he says, I might do a book. And we, and we hear this in the, in the tea. He says, maybe I'll do a book someday. And then we're thinking, well, what's he going to do with 4,000 hours of audio tape in a book? Uh, what's he going to do, transcribe it? Or is he going to, you know, th this wasn't being done then. And that's the other thing. He was so far ahead of his time doing this kind of comprehensive documenting of a place. There's actually, as far as we know, never been this much material recorded continuously in a single place. You're talking about eight years of taping constantly um, of this environment. Yeah, and when we say constantly, I mean, there's a section in the film, and I alluded to this, but He's recording the radio. I mean, you hear yeah. WINS, yeah. yeah. uh, you know, yeah. uh, uh, news yeah. broadcasts, the WCBS news broadcast, the television. There's a picture of 
John Kennedy on the screen. The, 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 you know, he's recording the phone. He's recording everything. It, I, I, I... Well, that's the other thing. He was a huge uh, lover of culture and, and media. And that was also, you know, it, it, he was very, it was a kind of thinking that was very advanced. After all, he's making these tapes, these quarter inch tapes. There's really not many people making, doing much with quarter inch tape at the time. This is before Andy Warhol yeah, this got is real, interested real in this. Real is, tape. Yeah, this is before the Warhol idea of, you know, taping everything. And before, it's really, uh, it's really very, very remarkable thinking and a remarkable process that he, that he went through for what we don't know. In answer to your question a, a couple of minutes ago, we don't know what he was doing there. Remarkable in the film, and there, there are many remarkable things, but there's a segment late in Sarah's film um, of Thelonious Monk uh, at the loft who spent three weeks there in 58 or 59 uh, rehearsing his band, 10-piece ten, ten band, but also working with a guy on, who he respected, obviously, on new arrangements of his. Let me talk about that a little bit. Well, they were planning for a concert, uh, uh, the Thelonious Monk Big Band Concert at Town Hall, which is a famous, a famous kind of jazz document. Monk um, wrote a lot of tunes that had become successful mm. and and they thought they wanted to get it out there a little more uh, you know spread the word about monk and one way to do it was to arrange the some of the tunes for a big band and uh they needed somebody to work with monk on making these arrangements and that's what they were doing in the loft and it, they turned to this other remarkable fellow one of many who were at the loft hall overton now overton was an instructor at Juilliard. Of classical music. Of classical music. <laughs> and a composer of his own very trendy at that time music, not so tonal, not so melodic, very uh, uh, kind of serial music, atonal music. And he was very involved in that. But at the same time, he was a cool cat. He was a, you know, loved jazz, loved monk, and really understood it, uh, you know, on a, the level of a musician, understood what Monk was doing, which a lot of people at the time didn't. Exactly, and still don't, <laughs> some people. Yeah. Um, this good time to go to that uh, section of, of Sarah's film. Is that what you want, or do you want your bomb bonita? That's a 16th note, that bomb note. But there's two ways that you can hear that line, the way you're playing it. They, they talk through the piano. Their pianos talk. That was amazing to see them speak the language of music. Yeah. It's a short note. And Paul was writing away. Well, Hall had the training to really notate accurately. So when Monk and he were together, Monk would sit down and say, blam. He would hold down his fingers on the piano for that chord until Hall could write down every single note that Monk was playing. There's an empty major. Mm -hmm. There's an empty major after that. Fill out. Yeah, that's just empty. This is held only one beat then, the way you sang it. Here's Monk teaching him how to play his music, like an exacting teacher. Wow. That clip <laughs> should be in the Smithsonian. And <laughs> Some more of that. All right, let's take it. Let's, let's go talk. to the Smithsonian right call, now. Uh, uh, Craig, call the Smithsonian. <laughs> Craig's my producer. Call the Smithsonian, tell them we got some. There's another, I, I, it's so lovely. I, I don't know what other word to use. In, in describing what you were just talking about before the clip of, of, you know, how difficult Monk's music was, and lots of people didn't understand it, it was difficult for the musicians. And you have an interview with, with a guy who's playing French horn. Oh yeah. In in the uh, in the in in the Monk band. Robert Northern. Monk was known for uh, sometimes leaving the bandstand and dancing. This was something that he did yeah. from time to time. And on this 
on this occasion, Robert Northern tells the story of struggling with a passage and feeling that it just, you know, wasn't swinging in the right way. It was a little academic or whatever the problem was. And um, he knew that Monk knew that he knew that this was all playing out, but he tells the very touching story that Monk never, you know, never said anything, never, you know, reprimanded him in any way. He just, he just went over and danced. He danced, he danced the part, he, he danced the French the, horn the, part. The solo. He danced the French horn solo. He danced the rhythm of it. And Northern said, I just, I just got it, you know. He didn't have to say a word. <laughs> so things like that, you know, are kind of beautiful. There are no jazz laws, I th think, today, are there? In this uh, there may be, but not on this, not in this model. Certainly well, not in Manhattan anymore. We should t we should mention w w what a jazz loft was and what it meant in terms of. I mean, jazz in this city in the '40s and '50s was a big deal. Uh, so these these places where they could just gather and play were yeah. really important. Yes, and you're also you're talking about people. Remember who are playing club dates till one, two in the morning. Mm. So, you know, or maybe only till eleven at night. But, you know, what they would do is they would they get up at two, three in the afternoon or whatever. They'd play, you know, they'd have a meal or whatever, go and play their club date, and then they were all wound up by that time. They didn't want to go home. Some people they had played with, and some people they didn't. There's a wonderful clip of, you know, a couple of musicians meeting for the first time. It's such a great thing, you know, oh, I've heard of you, I've heard of you, you know, and, and there they are, they both meet at the loft. Well, uh, we've heard of Zoot Sims. If you haven't, then I don't know what planet you've been on. But uh, Zoot was there, and before we run out of time, let's look at Zoot Sims at the Jazz Loft. Well, let's blow one. Yeah, man. I might play for, you know, three or four hours without stopping. It would be almost like, like entering into a trance. Zoot was fabulous. And he had that ability to be played like Laurence Olivier or Marlon Brando. As soon as Zoot made a musical entrance, he put like two notes and suddenly, ah. Dan Morgenstern, the, the renowned uh, jazz historian and, and founder, I think, of the, of the Institute at Rutgers Jazz Institute, had retired now. Um, I was talking to him not a few days ago about Monk, and you know, he said some of the some of the perceptions of this guy that he was difficult, that he was as a person, that he was difficult, that he uh, didn't talk. Not really true. That's one of the things that was revealed by these tapes, yeah. was this remarkable collaboration between Monk and Overton, you know, hard to reach, not at all. They, were, they had a wonderful rapport. Monk talked, they exchanged information, they corrected each other. Um, Monk was clearly in charge of that, you know, that yeah, session, and, the, and, and yet... You know, there was a wonderful spirit of accommodation on both sides. So. Yeah, and uh, I mean, one of the musicians says, you know, Monk could show up and we're here, and he'd say, listen, go downstairs, go to the bar, have a few drinks, and come back when you're ready, and we'll, we'll start. But then they would, <laughs> once they started, it was work. Yeah. And, and um, uh, you know, and, and the man dances, <laughs> the man dances the rhythm of a, of a solo in order to, Teach, yeah, and that's what jazz laws were about. In in some sense, teaching, you know, they they could. I don't mean. It seems musicians could learn from each other just by the improvisation of what they were doing. Yes, but you also mentioned the word work, and I think it's an essential thing that can be found from this material. You know, there's this sense that jazz just sort of, it's cool and it happens in the moment and it's all improvised anyway, and you know. And this is really, this material really shows you firsthand, second by second, minute by minute, that these guys were working all the time. And wanted to, wanted to, play. I mean. Almost as if they were storing it up so that when the moment of inspiration 
came, you know, when they're on, when they're in a club and the moment of inspiration came, they'd be ready. Yeah. They, were, they were working constantly, all day, all night, and Gene too, and he was very much in the spirit of that, so. Yeah, as somebody says, he was playing his camera. The film is The Jazz Loft. Sarah, where can people see it? Well, I believe it's still uh, available on Amazon Prime. Yes, it is. Amazon That's where Prime. I saw it. But if you search, the full title of the film is The Jazz Loft According to W. Eugene Smith. Mm -hmm. And searching that title will take you to it on a number of platforms. There's also a DVD uh, that can be purchased, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's very much around. And if you happen to be in Washington, D.C. on April 23rd, it will be screened at the Library of Congress. So. Wow. And you'll be there, right? <laughs> and I'll be there. Um, I'm fascinated that, it, does that mean it's going to, what does that mean? It's going to go into the Library of Congress? I'm not sure what it means. It <laughs> means that I've been summoned to go there and speak about it, and it'll be showing on that date. Beyond that, I honestly don't know. What date is it? Tell April us. April 23. At the Library of Congress. It's been a delight to go over this material with you. There's so much more we could do, but uh, let's leave it at this. There's a film out there. It's on Amazon Prime where you can buy it. Uh, Sarah told you its complete name. It's a remarkable uh, piece of work that she w wrote and directed. And if you can't find the film, and I hope you can, there's, there's Sarah's um, uh, series, the Jazz Loft series on WNYC. Right. Sarah Fisco, a delight to be with you. Thank you, my pleasure. And thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.